In one of his sermons speaking on 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, a passage that talks about the day of the Lord, Paul Washer described the kind of people who will be left behind at the rapture when the Lord comes as a thief in the night. He talked about a group of people who he described as being willingly blind. He said, The Bible says you know, but you are willingly blind, and you willingly ignore, and because of that, you are not preparing for His coming. You do not fear His coming. You do not expect His coming. And therefore, His coming will come upon you like a thief in the night. There is another group of people who he described saying, You might be a very noble person compared to other men. You might be dignified. You might be intellectual. You might be keen in all the manner and modes that people want to act. But the fact of the matter is, you are given over to your lust of your flesh. You might be a very religious person and delight in religious things, but you are given over to the lust of the flesh apart from Christ. But if Christ is not the center of your relationship with God, if He's not your hope, if He's not your love, if He is not your delight, then you are hostile towards God. So here we have two groups of people who have been described. Those who are willingly blind, meaning they choose to ignore the warnings in the Bible and the teachings in the Bible. The second of those who are hostile to God because Jesus Christ is not first in their lives. When it comes to the rapture of the church, the Bible tells us that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. It tells us that in a flash, in the blink of an eye, those who have died will be raised and live forever. And we who are living will also be transformed. It will be sudden. It will be unexpected. Scientists will gather together day and night trying to figure out what happened. Loved ones will be crushed because they were told. They were told that this day would come. And so they will run to their local church and find that nearly every church is packed with people who are distraught and weeping because they know. They know that they have been left behind. And so they are in the churches crying and praying. But it is too late. The rapture of the church has already happened. And those who are left behind know that their only chance to spend eternity in heaven is to reject the Antichrist and pay the ultimate price. So, dear friend, if you can hear me today, if you still have breath in your lungs today, get right with Jesus Christ. Does Revelation 22 verse 12 not say, Behold, I am coming quickly? Does 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 2 not say, For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. There should be an urgency in our lives. There should be an urgency in terms of how we live. Because there is certainly an urgency in the Word of God about how soon Christ is to return. Have you ever been given a warning? Perhaps you have been in a building when the fire alarm went off, or you have been driving when a loud siren indicates that there is an emergency nearby. Perhaps you have lived in a part of the country where citywide sirens indicate tornado or hurricane warnings. There are also warnings from economists, politicians, and newscasters telling us about the latest things to be afraid of. We receive warnings that the economy will crash in X amount of years, or you should beware of this or that thing. Most of us are accustomed to warnings. They are part of our daily lives. Some of us heed them, some of us don't. Some are ruled and dominated by the fear that these warnings generate, and others view them as nothing more than crying wolf conspiracies. However, as Christians, we are given quite a few warnings in Scripture. Here are some of the scenarios that God warned His people. Adam and Eve were warned that if they ate from the fruit on the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they would surely die. God warned Abraham and Lot that Sodom and Gomorrah were about to be destroyed. The children of Israel were warned that if they didn't keep God's covenant, they would be visited with all manner of curses and disaster. Over and over in Scripture, 
People are warned on several matters, from worshiping other gods to breaking covenant to repenting. In the New Testament, Jesus issues a number of warnings himself. The way he phrased it was as woes. The word woe could be translated in modern terminology as beware or judgment or curses upon you. This is how serious Jesus was about the warnings he was giving. In Luke chapter 11, verse 42 to 47, the Bible reads, But woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the best seat in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, for you are like unmarked graves, and people walk over them without knowing it. One of the lawyers answered him, Teacher, in saying these things, you insult us also. And he said, Woe to you lawyers also, for you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets whom your fathers killed. So what exactly was Jesus warning us about, and who was the warning for? In our passage for today, Jesus' woes were originally given for the religious leaders of his day, Pharisees, scribes, and lawyers. The Pharisees were a Jewish sect or denomination in modern terms who heavily emphasized the perfect observance of the law or Torah. In the Torah, there were 613 commandments that Jews were expected to adhere to. Now, because of their disobedience historically, which led to the exile in Babylon back in 563 BC, the Pharisees decided that they would follow the commandments perfectly so that what happened back then would never happen again. They attempted to follow the 613 so perfectly that they set up laws around the 613 laws so they wouldn't even get close to breaking the actual 613. The problem with this type of legalism is that it can tend to drown out the heart or the purpose of the laws themselves. This is what Jesus was warning them about and what he still warns us of today. Jesus pronounces judgment on the Pharisees on three points, legalism, performative religion, and pride. He chastised them for being so concerned about the letter of the law that they neglected the heart of the law, love. If all you're concerned about is following protocol and rules, but you don't have the love of God in you, then you've missed the mark. If you're so concerned about upholding your rules and your morals that you alienate and isolate people in the process, you have missed the point. When do we ever see Jesus in the Gospels turning away people because they're too sinful or too messy or because they are struggling with this sin or that sin? We don't. In fact, the only people Jesus is hard on in all of the Gospels are the judgmental, overbearing religious leaders. Another thing that Jesus rebukes the Pharisees for is pride. He rebukes them for doing things just for show. They love to have the best seats in the synagogues. They pray loudly and fast publicly and make grand gestures of their giving so that everybody knows they are holy. But do you know that underneath the facade of holiness, there is a more insidious motive of making people think we are better than them. The ways we do this aren't much different than the Pharisees. Look at me and how much I give for offering every week. Look how I'm fasting and you're not. Look how eloquently I pray and how inadequate your prayers are if you pray at all. Look at how clean my life is and how dirty yours is. So many of us carry this same spiritual pride with us. And spiritual pride is worse than regular pride. Spiritual pride makes us feel like we are more loved by God than anyone else. It makes us believe we are better and more special when the truth is that God does not play favorites. God does not love the person who prays and worships 18 hours a day more than the sinner who has never prayed a day in their life. God loves all of us. Jesus also pronounces woe upon the lawyers the legal experts. They make laws and rules that they can't even keep. They hold others to a standard that they themselves cannot live up to. When talking to this group of people, Jesus said, For you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. 
Jesus makes an extremely strong statement and says that they themselves will not enter the kingdom of God, but they make it impossible for anyone else to enter as well. Why is Jesus being so hard on these religious leaders? Because they missed the point. Today, we must be careful that we're not missing the point. If all of our rules and standards are causing us to hurt, alienate, isolate, and traumatize people, then we are no better than the whitewashed graves that Jesus called these leaders. The heart of the gospel is compassion and love. If we have missed those, then we too are under Jesus' woes. So I encourage you, have a genuine love of God. Have genuine passion for the things of God. Jesus Christ loved all people. He loved those who were sick and rejected by society. He loved the tax collectors and the lepers. He loved all and wanted no soul to perish. As followers of Jesus Christ, we too must have a burning passion for lost souls and unbelievers. We must have this same love that Christ had. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4 to 8, Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. This, my friends, is the kind of love we should have. We're all comforted by the thought of God being eternally loving, which He is. We get that lovely, warm feeling inside when we read of God being our mighty protector, our shield and defense. He certainly is all of the above. We love the fact that God is forever merciful. He is kind and gracious. However, allow me to say this sternly. God is not to be mocked. Oftentimes we can deliberately sin. We can deliberately disobey all because we think that the nature of God, His kind nature, we think that His nature will overlook our wrongs. However, this is not the case. God hates sin. The Bible in Psalm 5 verse 4 says, For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. He is a God who doesn't delight in sin. He takes no pleasure from it. That's why the wages of sin are death. The Lord is too righteous and holy for sin to even be in his presence. He's, he's too pure for that. And so what happens when God gets angry? What happens when people sin day after day and mock him? What happens when people forget that the Bible says in Exodus 34, verse 14, For you shall worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. What strikes me about the children of Israel is that they were set free. They were led, cared for, and blessed by the Lord, but yet still found a reason to complain. Their hearts were ungrateful and they sinned with their unthankful attitudes as they murmured and complained. Now the Bible reads in Numbers chapter 11, verse 1 and 2, And the people complained in the hearing of the Lord about their misfortunes. And when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled. And the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some outlying parts of the camp. Then the people cried out to Moses, and Moses prayed to the Lord, and the fire died down. 
The decision to overlook the goodness of God led to an outpouring of his wrath. So you see, God is loving, but he is not to be mocked. He is patient, but he is not weak. So we should not provoke him to anger. You can't deceive him or think that you can pull a fast one on him. He is omnipresent. He is omniscient and all-knowing. 